a whistler. Presented by the United States Air Forces in Europe. I am the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Tonight transcribed at the Whistler's strange story, Seven Steps to Murder. The Atkins Clayton affair was unusual for two reasons. In the first place, of course, it involved a pair of famous newspaper men. Archer Atkins, the dean of New York drama critics, and Everett Clayton, a syndicated columnist. But more than that, it was interesting in its structure. Yes, there were seven distinct steps between an apparently cordial relationship and a murder. The opening night of Clayton's first play at a whirlwind was step number one. Atkins had attended, of course, with the rest of the critics, and shortly after the final curtain, had walked across the street to the offices of the New York Globe with Murchison, his editor, to meet the newspaper's deadline. Hmm. Everett Clayton's new play, The Whirlwind, opened last night at the Brighton Theater with Diana Brooks and Paul Strand in the leading role. Very sure, Atkins? Oh, well, much of them. Uh, I want to see what you did to Clayton's play. I thought it was great. Oh, did you? Here's what I thought. Hmm. Everett Clayton's new play, The Whirlwind, is dullness itself is utterly lacking in originality, imagination, or even ordinary playability. The death rattle was audible before the first act was five minutes old. Listen, Atkins, you can't. Oh, why can't I? You grew up together. You came from Texas together. You were even engaged to his sister. He's your best friend. Art knows no friendship. You're a liar. You're jealous because Clayton's invading the drama, your sacred territory. Well, if that's true, you should fire me. Uh, too bad I'm too influential, huh? You know... One of these days, you'll stick your neck out too far, and I'll chop it off. Your review of Everett Clayton's play was step number two. The next day, you see Clayton in the coffee shop of the Stratford Club, where both of you live. He walks over to your booth, his face tense and expression, the paper folded in his pocket. Well, Everett, good to see you. Sit down, please. Thank you. Wait up. Yes, sir. Coffee, please. Yes, sir. Two. No coffee for me. Milk. Yes, sir. Your stomach again? Uh, I'm getting worse, I'm afraid. But that's not why I came, is it, Archer? I suppose not. That review, Archer. Nice of you. You're not a playwright, Everett. You, uh... You at least saw the play, I presume. Of course. An author spends a year writing a play, and that's the consideration he gets. Any of your money in it? Everything I've got. Oh, too bad. Why didn't you consult me before? Let me read it. Because I knew what I'd get. Sarcasm, smart cracks, not one bit of constructive criticism. There is a small item you've forgotten. Talent. No one has yet succeeded in drawing milk from an elephant. Nor kindness from a critic. If you wanted charity, you should have said so. Do you want me to go over it scene by scene and show you how bad it is? No, because you couldn't. That's the trouble, you know. The people don't decide what's good or bad anymore. They wait for the critics to tell them. Well, thanks to you, I know my play is dead, Atkins. But I also know you're a fake. You've been phony all your life. If the Rover Boys in Switzerland had Edgar Allan Poe's name on it, you'd call it great. No, easy, old boy. You're getting carried away. You picked on the wrong guy, Archer. I've got 20 million readers, too, and before this thing's over, I'm going to make you look like the village idiot. Just do me a favor, Atkins. Check my column tomorrow. It'll interest you. <laughs> Uh, 
And now, back to The Whistler. soon to become famous as the Atkins-Clayton affair, fell neatly into seven parts, seven steps to murder. Clayton's play, of course, was the first step, and the scathing review that appeared in the Globe the next day over your signature was the second. But when you arrive at your office the next day, Murchison, the editor, is sitting on your desk waiting for you, the afternoon edition of the ledger in his hand. Hello, Murchison. Did you read Clayton's column? I did not. Lead paragraph. Listen. I am now reconciled to the fact that my play, The Whirlwind, will close in a matter of days as a result of the efforts of a group of critics headed by Archer Atkins. As a matter of fact, Atkins is not equipped to set himself up as a critic or even a writer. He has no conception of literature, dramatic, poetic, or otherwise. And I intend to prove it. Well, amusing, but not very. You started all of this, Atkins. I think you should I'm apologize. I'm going to be quite busy, Murchison. I'm sure there are a few obituaries that require your keen intelligence. I hope Clayton gives you a sock on the jaw. That's step number three, Archer. The public challenge that went out to 20 million readers. You decide it's ridiculous, of course, and forget about it. The play lasts five days and closes. Then one evening, some weeks later, Barbara Ross, the fashion editor on the ledger, walks up to you in the lobby and taps you on the shoulder. Archer, darling. Oh, good evening, my dear. Archer, I found something I thought you'd want to glance at. Why, did Clayton put me in print again? <laughs> Nothing like that. Somebody hadn't made his book of poetry. Of course, sir. It was printed privately, only 50 copies. So let me see. Uh, 14 by Jafar Ahmed. What's it about? Well, I think it's lovely. It's written by an immigrant boy about his love for a little girl. Oh, no, thank you. Oh, but our oh, poetry, sir. darling, is as much a part of adolescence as the first shave, and just about as important. But it's really quite good. The boy seems to have an excellent sense of meter and a, a good deal of insight, too. Archer, you know so much more about poetry than anyone else I know. All right, dear. Uh, I'll look it over. Step number four, the book of poetry. Nothing to it, of course, is there, Archer? But you take it home and toss it on the nightstand. And just before you decide to turn out the light, you pick it up and glance at the first page. It holds you from the start. There's something about the poems that haunts you, almost as if you'd read them before. Memory, things you'd forgotten completely spring to life. Yes, this boy has managed to capture something out of every man's youth. Something that gets under your skin and stays there. You finish the book. Get out of bed hurriedly and sit down at your typewriter. You can't wait until tomorrow, can you, Archer? You've got to get it on paper now. <sighs> Although the poems are immature, there's something great and universal about this work. The volume has been printed privately, but in my opinion, it would be a wise investment for any publisher to issue it in quantity. Fourteen by Jaffa Ahmed should never be forgotten. Ah, I ought to do it. It'll be on the bestseller list in a month. you hand your article to a copy boy, unaware, of course, that you've just completed step number five. Although you don't know it, the minute you turned in that review, you moved nearer to murder than you've ever been in your life. Yes, 
life just 24 hours later when the same boy walks into your office, places a newspaper on your desk. Step number six. Here's your copy of the legend. No, no. Round town with every plate. Oh, here we are. Three months ago, I promised to reveal Archer Atkins, the so-called Dean of Literary Critics, as a phony. Today, I call attention to the rave he's been giving the book of poems called Fourteen, supposedly written by a 14-year-old Iranian lad. The fact is, gentle readers, I wrote Fourteen. What a shocking, eh, Archer? Oh, 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 hello, no, I just I didn't see you. That's all right. You needn't hide that. Some of our best people read Everett Clayton, including the publishers of this paper. That's trash. Just trash. And lies, too, I suppose. Oh, Clayton never wrote 14. He hasn't got enough sense. Seems to know a lot about it, Archer. Read on. He tells just how he did it. He had no knowledge of poetry, he says. Just threw together the lushest and most senseless adjectives he could concoct. Had the whole mess printed up on the quiet. <laughs> you, the great Archer Atkins, praised it to the skies. Are you trying to tell me that you believe this nonsense? What is what a man's... A man's got readers, Archer. Twenty million of them, so calm down. Don't tell me to calm down. As a matter of fact, why don't you get out of here? Let me have that typewriter. I'll teach Clayton his place. Not in a globe, you won't. And why not? I talked to the publishers. We want your resignation by the end of the month. From now on, I'm editing your material, and I don't intend to have any libel suits on my hands. Not even to save the great name of Archer Atkins. Good day. Well, for once I've had the last word. Well, Archer, a turn you never expected. And it's even worse when you reach the Stratford Club and learn that you've suddenly been turned into a laughing stock. <laughs> well, Archer, old boy, how could you? What was it now? I, uh, I still feel the music, the poignant expression of an adolescent love. <laughs> Sweetly agonizing emotions, part of every man's youth. <laughs> I wonder about a poisonous pain on your skull, my dear hand. Gentlemen, yes, gentlemen, you hear? The great Atkins is no longer capable of using his cutting tongue. He must now resort to a cane. <laughs> thing has got you, hasn't it, Archer? And it hurts deep, twisting inside you until finally the seventh step begins to take shape. The seventh and final step, murder. <laughs> the frightening thought, isn't it, Archer? Frightening but very clear. It's all there in your mind as you ride up to your luxurious suite in the elevator. Everett Clayton is a man of habit. One of them forced upon him by his health. You know all about that, Archer. How each evening at seven, a waiter brings a large glass of milk into his apartment. You smile as you let yourself into your rooms across the hall. Tonight, that same waiter must bring you something as well. Hello. Hello, coffee shop. This is Mr. Atkins. I wonder if you'd send me up something, huh? Oh, I don't know. Something light, a chicken sandwich, perhaps. Oh, no, no hurry. Well, said you, you have a waiter coming to Mr. Clayton's rooms at seven. That's time enough, surely. Yes, don't make a special trip. Thank you. A waiter... Yes, sir. Uh, you have a sandwich and coffee for me? Oh, yes, sir. But I was going to stop first at Mr. Clayton. Uh, yes, we'll come in a moment. I'll set it down there on the desk, will you? And I wonder if you'd do something for me. I um, I tried to unlock a suitcase a moment ago, but I couldn't seem to turn the key. Would uh, you have a look at it, please? Why, certainly, sir. Where is it? In the bedroom. Of course, it's too much trouble. Not at all, sir. I have handled a lot of things. hesitate as the waiter starts across to the bedroom. Then you turn quickly to the tray he set down on your desk. Before he comes back, you empty the contents of a small envelope into the milk intended for Clayton. You stir it hastily, and then return to your book. Well, 
I got it open for you, sir. That lock is sprung a little bit, though. Oh, well, I'll have to have it attended to. Here you go. Thanks for your trouble. Not at all, sir. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. You settle back in your chair now, giving the waiter time to deliver the glass of milk to Clayton. A few minutes later, you slip out into the corridor and down the hall. Stop outside of Clayton's door and listen. He's talking to someone on the telephone. Yes, yes, I got your letter. and lock it. A glance at Clayton's body sprawled on the floor assures you that he's dead. Quickly, you cross the room and sit down at his battered, portable typewriter. To my dear mother, comma, my sister, comma, and gentle readers, colon. It isn't often that a man gets the opportunity to write his own obituary, period. Believe me, comma, this isn't easy, comma, but I've been ill for some ten years now. You type rapidly, Archer, because you know exactly what you want Clayton's suicide note to say. It includes, above all else, a confession, one in which the dead Everett Clayton will admit to the world that he perpetrated a deliberate hoax against you. His note tells how he lied in claiming to have written the verses in the book 14. How actually, he simply dug up a number of anonymous ballads and revised them a bit. You put it all down, Archer, your way. But if ever it's Clayton style. And then you add his well-known signature. Just the two simple typewritten letters. E, C. Thanks, my dear Everett. We'll see tomorrow how your 20 million readers like this one. Publishers, Hanley, and the whole literary world will have to admit who has the right to wear the critic's crown. You don't seem at all surprised at the police calling on you, Mr. Atkins. Oh, my dear Captain uh, Foss, well, the moment the manager of this club informed me of Clayton's demise, I resigned myself to a round of dull questions. Naturally. You've known him all his life. Grew up with him, sweet on his sister at Anything one time. Anything else you want to know? I was an incubator baby, weighed three pounds, two and one third ounces. I'm surprised you aren't more interested in the way Clayton died. I like to believe people, Captain. When I'm told someone is dead, I assume he's dead. Whether he was shot through the head with a cannon, threw himself into Mount Vesuvius, or was clubbed to death with the missing arm of Venus de Milo, doesn't concern me in the least. Poison is more to your liking, isn't it? I don't know what you're trying to imply. Well, let's make it clear, then. How long did it take you to write that note? Note, Captain? The suicide note in Clayton's typewriter. Oh, do tell. In verse, no doubt. It says Clayton never wrote those poems, that he stole them from some anonymous ballads. Well, I insisted on that all the time. To- Wait till I get hold of that editor. You wrote that note, Atkins. 
You poisoned Clayton and ran the note off on his typewriter. <gasps> Nonsense. Who gave you that story? Some idiot from the ledger. Take a look at these papers, Atkins. Ever seen them before? Uh, they're yellow. They're very old, aren't they? They're poems you wrote to Everett Clayton's sister when you were 14, over 40 years ago. What? That book of poetry you reviewed was not written by Jafar Ahmed or Everett Clayton, but by Archer Atkins. You was my own poetry. So it wasn't suicide, you see. Now, wait a minute. He, he still did it. It was a malicious trick. Now, listen, Captain. It wasn't I, suicide, Atkins. Uh, because Clayton's sister blew up when she read what he did with those poems after she sent them to him. She phoned him last night. He was talking to his sister. She made him promise a public retraction. Clayton was going to see you about it in the morning. again next week when once again the United States Air Forces in Europe presents The Whistler.